Hi everyone, my name is Sergey Levin, and today I'm going to talk about imitation learning and reinforcement learning. All right, so we'll start off uh, with a brief uh, summary of what imitation learning and offline RL are. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that most of you watching this talk have some background in imitation learning and RL, but I'll just provide a quick summary to sort of frame how we can look at these two problems. So imitation learning in its simplest form uh, can be uh, framed as behavioral form. You get a data set of states and actions from some expert demonstrator, oftentimes a person, and then you're just going to run supervised learning to predict the actions that the expert took from the states. So your goal is to essentially recover the expert's policy. On the other side, reinforcement learning classically is seen as something very different. Reinforcement learning is, a, is an active online learning paradigm where you have an agent that interacts with the world by taking actions, the world responds with states and rewards, and the agent's goal is, through trial and error, to acquire a policy that maximizes some reward function. So while both of these things acquire policies, they do so seemingly in very different ways. However, if we would like to develop data-driven uh, frameworks for learning behaviors, then these two paradigms might actually start looking pretty similar. So we can uh, draw a diagram uh, explaining behavioral cloning like this. You have some unknown expert policy that is denoted here as pi beta. That expert policy, which could be the unknown policy you know, in, in the brain of a person, interacted with the world and collected uh, transitions. And then you're going to use those transitions, specifically the relationship between states and actions, to train a policy that will predict the expert's actions from the states. On the other side, you can cast reinforcement learning into a data-driven paradigm like this as well, and this is referred to as offline RL, where, again, you have some policy, pi beta, that interacted with the world, collected transitions, and now you're going to learn a policy from these transitions. Now, I intentionally drew these two uh, things in a way that makes them seem very similar. So in the diagram on the left and the diagram on the right, the only difference is the, an, the assumption about the policy that collected the data. So in imitation learning, we assume that the data was collected by an expert, meaning a policy that was either optimal or near optimal for the true reward function of the task. And on the right, in offline RL, in general, we do not make this assumption. We would say that we can allow for pi beta to be just about anything. All right. So hopefully this picture kind of gives you a taste for why uh, it might make sense to put these things in a correspondence. All right, so what's the difference? Well, the difference, roughly speaking, is that in imitation learning, by assuming that the behavior policy is optimal, it's you know, very straightforward to frame the problem as one of essentially recovering the policy that generated the data. In offline reinforcement learning, the goal is a little different. Uh, you can think of it, for example, as trying to get order out of chaos. So uh, the behavior policy interacted with the world and collected a wide variety of different trajectories. And what you want to do is you want to find a policy that sort of lives inside of the coverage of that data, uh, but does better at the task than the behavior policy, maybe even better than any single trajectory that you've seen. So this is actually a pretty significant difference in many cases. But there is a similarity here, and there's a subtlety that actually results in quite a lot of ambiguity as to whether we should be using offline RL or imitation learning for particular kinds of problems. And this uncertainty has manifested itself in a number of recent research works as well. So any functional offline RL method has to do two things. One, it has to stay close to the provided data. That's very, very important because if you're running reinforcement learning but you're not collecting additional data, what you don't want to do is learn to carry out behaviors that are too different than what we see in the data because you have no way of knowing what will happen. And of course, the second thing that any offline RL method needs to do is it needs to maximize reward because that's basically the whole point. So staying close to the provided data could mean something like pi of a given s should not be high for actions a that are unlikely under pi beta of a given s. So basically don't do things that are too different from what was done in the data. Now that doesn't mean that you are not allowed to take any action that you didn't see. So basically what you want to do is you want to only allow those actions for which you're confident you can generalize to accurately estimate their value. That's basically the important part. So you don't want to take actions that are too unlikely because you won't know what they'll do. And maximize reward just means that the expected sum of discounted reward needs to be big. So that's kind of the, the obvious thing. Now, behavioral cloning or imitation learning 
does exactly the first thing, but not the second thing. And there's a tension between these two things. In many cases, the more you maximize the reward, the less you'll stay close to the provided data. So oftentimes, effective offline RL algorithms need to trade off one and two very intelligently in order to both maximize the reward and avoid uh, doing things for which they have no way of predicting the outcome, which of course risks doing very poorly at testing. So there's a tension between these two things. And that tension is actually why, in some cases, it might be very tempting to believe that imitation learning is actually a better answer than offline RL. For example, uh, perhaps a given data set doesn't per permit behavior that is much better in terms of reward without deviating a lot from the data. This could be the case, of course, if you have a very good data set. So if Pi Beta really was an expert policy, then perhaps staying close to the data and maximizing reward is kind of the same thing. And we'll talk about that case in quite a lot of detail. But it could also mean that the behavior policy was bad, but the only way to make it better is to deviate too much from the data. And that's also a possibility. So uh, number two uh, you know, might be very important and it might, be, it might take you far away from the behavior policy, but that doesn't mean necessarily that behavior cloning is going to yield a worse solution. It could be that there isn't a better solution that both stays close to the data and maximizes reward. Okay, so why is this a question? Why are we concerned about this? Because it kind of seems like from the discussion so far, it's like, well, offline RL can help by maximizing the reward. Maybe it won't help in some cases, but it doesn't seem like it should hurt. Well, the reason that this is a question is because behavioral cloning, unlike offline RL, is really simple and really easy to use. It's very stable because it's just supervised learning. It's uh, comparatively easy to debug and validate, and it scales well to large data sets. These are all very appealing things, especially in a data-driven setting, because if we're in a data-driven setting, it's probably because we want to use large and diverse data sets in order to generalize effectively, and there the ability to scale well to large data sets becomes really important. And indeed, we've seen some very impressive uh, results in recent years of imitation learning methods, for example, in these two robotics papers, uh, doing uh, you know, very sophisticated behaviors, generalizing effectively, uh, performing tasks in a variety of environments, and so on. The other thing is, we could actually try to design algorithms that look more like behavioral cloning, but have some elements of that bullet point number two that actually incorporate rewards in some way. For example, by filtering the data. So if you have data that is uh, mixed, some of it is good and some of it is bad, you can just throw out the bad stuff and imitate the good stuff. Or you can also condition the policy on some task information and then uh, select the conditioning value that you want. And we'll talk about this as well in quite a lot of detail. So. For these reasons, we might really prefer to use behavioral cloning if possible. And that makes it really important to answer, should you imitate or should you reinforce? Now, I'll say right now that the basic premise of this talk is that at the end, once you drill down to the details, reinforcement learning often actually becomes the better choice, but with a few important caveats. And um, it's um, not quite as clear cut when you actually get down to the particular details of the problem, especially if you're willing to bring in a little bit of inductive bias. All right, so here are the questions that I'm gonna address in this talk. One, uh, should you run behavioral cloning or offline RL if you have near optimal data? So that's the case where it would seem like staying close to the data to maximize the reward are one and the same. Number two, you can get behavioral cloning to solve RL problems. Number three, can you somehow combine behavioral cloning and RL? I'll provide the answers now and then justify them in the rest of the talk. So the answer to the first question, surprisingly, is that if you do things right, you can just run offline RL. And there's a theoretical reason why it's preferred even with optimal data in many cases. The answer to number two is sort of, but the details here really matter. The thing is you can get behavioral cloning to solve RL problems, but it solves them in a different way and for a slightly different reason and in practice puts a higher burden on your ability to inject inductive bias into the learning process. So we'll talk about what that means um, in the second part of the talk. And the answer to the third part is yes, and in fact it can actually work very well. Uh, it slots very neatly into this view of offline RL as having two steps and basically separates those steps uh, to solve them with different components. So that can be a really good idea to yield effective offline RL methods. But let's start with the first question. So let's uh, again carefully put offline RL and behavior cloning side by side and talk about what happens uh, when we have near optimal data. So here are the pictures that I showed before. 
and they differ only in the sense that pi beta in the case of imitation learning is an expert policy and in the case of reinforcement learning does not need to be an expert policy. Any functional offline RL method needs to stay close to the data and maximize reward. And of course, there's a tension between those things. So what if they both get the same near optimal data? Well, it would seem like at that point, behavioral cloning is giving you everything you could possibly want. Behavioral cloning is, is trying to recover pi beta, and pi beta is the optimal policy. But if we actually look at the errors that behavioral cloning makes, then the problem becomes a little bit more complex. See, the trouble is that both behavioral cloning on and offline RL will not be perfect at staying close to the provided data. And by analyzing their imperfections, we can actually understand why one or the other might be preferable. So to start our journey into understanding this question, we first have to talk a little bit about why behavioral cloning might not give you the right answer, why it might not perfectly recover pi beta. So this is you know, fairly basic behavioral cloning error analysis. Uh, the intuition behind why behavioral cloning might not give you a very good solution is that if this black curve represents a training trajectory and you train on that trajectory with supervised learning and then you run the resulting policy, which will be shown in red, uh, that policy will make some mistake. It'll make a small mistake, but that small mistake will cause you to deviate, even if a little bit, from the training trajectory. And when you deviate a little bit, you will find yourself in a state that is a little bit different than any state you saw in the training. And because that state is a little bit different, you will make a slightly bigger mistake. And then you will find yourself in a yet more different state and make a yet bigger mistake and find yourself in a yet more different state. And these mistakes will snowball until you've made a really big mistake by the end of the trajectory. We can formalize this intuition. and The formalization is actually very simple. Um, let's say that the total length of these trajectories is h. What we're going to try to understand is how the error of behavior cloning scales in h. Ideally, you'd like the error to be somehow uh, to scale very favorably with h. You, would, you don't want to make significantly bigger mistakes in longer trajectories than in shorter ones. So let's use a little example. It's going to be a grid world task that you can roughly think of as a tightrope walker. So for a tightrope walker, they have to keep walking down a tightrope, and if they deviate to the left or to the right, then they will fall. So let's say the demonstration walks perfectly on the tightrope, but if any of those gray squares, if the action goes up or down, then it will fall, and it can't get back on the tightrope. Let's assume that our cost function is uh, zero if you match the action of the behavior policy, which always walks to the right, and it's one otherwise. So you pay a cost of one every time you make a mistake. Um, and we're going to assume that your training error is bounded by epsilon. So in all the training states, the probability that you'll take a different action than, than the expert did is less than or equal to epsilon. Now the expert only ever stayed on the tightrope. So once you fall off, you don't know what the expert would have done in those states, and you're basically guaranteed to make a mistake. So uh, let's try to estimate the expected value of the cost that we'll get under this assumption. So our probability of making a mistake is epsilon. So that means that on the first time step, with probability epsilon, you will make a mistake, which means you'll fall off the tightrope. And after you've fallen off the tightrope, then you will incur a cost of one at every time step thereafter. So your total cost will be epsilon times h, which is the cost of one for all the remaining h steps, plus one minus epsilon times whatever you'll get if you keep going. Now, if you keep going, then you just find yourself in the second square of the tightrope, where again, you have a probability epsilon of making a mistake, and then you remain off the tightrope for h minus one steps, and so on and so on. So at every step, you have epsilon times h plus one minus epsilon times everything that comes afterwards. So that means that you have h terms, and each of these terms is on the order of epsilon h, which means that your total error is on the order of epsilon h squared. And this is the classic quadratic error bound in um, behavioral cloning. Now, uh, we're going to actually analyze a slightly different case. Uh, we're going to analyze a case where you don't pay a cost for making a mistake. It's actually a more obvious case where you pay a cost for falling off the tightrope. So what if you get a cost of one if you fall? Once you've fallen, basically you're dead. You don't incur any more costs. You just pay a cost of one. Well, then at the first time step, it's epsilon times one plus one minus epsilon times so on and so on. So everything's exactly the same, just the h terms went away. So now there's h terms each on the order of epsilon which means that the total error is on the order of epsilon h. And this is actually true for behavior cloning for any task where the total reward or the total cost is independent of the horizon. So these are basically success failure tasks, tasks where you do something and then at the end you're basically graded on whether you did it or not. So in that case, 
the uh, error in behavior cloning scales linearly with the horizon. So what we're going to study uh, in the work that I'm going to discuss next is whether reinforcement learning can do better than this linear scaling uh, in the case where uh, we have these uh, success or failure tests. Okay, so first a little bit of intuition. Why might we expect RL to actually help here? Well, value-based offline RL incorporates dynamics into the update, and hence it should be aware of the consequences of its actions. Imitating some critical actions might be more important than others, so not all actions are made equal. If you're just walking on the tightrope, of course, every action is important, but maybe some parts of your environment have a tightrope and some don't. So here's an example of this. Uh, here are the black lines. They don't denote vault walls, they actually denote cliffs. So you can sort of think of this as two buildings with a tightrope between them. Now, when you're on one building, like for example, in state A, then you know there is an optimal action, which is to go to the right, but if you take a suboptimal action, it's not that much worse. But when you're on the tightrope in state B, then there really is only one action that you need to take. Behavioral cloning doesn't realize this. Behavioral cloning copies all actions equally. Reinforcement learning in principle could do better by understanding the consequences of those actions and the fact that some of those actions matter a lot more than others. The other thing is that offline RL can benefit from suboptimal data because suboptimal data shows it what not to do. Uh, imitation learning is only harmed by some suboptimal data. Now, of course, you could say this is an unfair comparison. We're talking about an expert. But what we'll actually discuss is a case where imitation learning gets optimal data while offline RL gets suboptimal data. And that's an interesting case. Now, uh, first, I'm going to tell you kind of the bad news. The bad news is that under the most general assumptions, if you don't assume anything about the task, there is seemingly no benefit with near optimal data, at least as far as we know. So uh, the performance of behavioral cloning is bounded by uh, something that is on the order of H over M. The intuition behind this is basically the intuition that I had on the previous slide. There are different ways to construct these bounds, but roughly speaking, you're going to end up with bounds that are linear in H. And the N term is basically the sample complexity, so N is the number of samples. It makes sense that usually your sampling error is going to go as uh, 1 over N or 1 over root N, uh, depending on the nature of the analysis. So there are different ways to derive these bounds, but in general, you're going to get something like H over N if you have... Um, these uh, success failure tasks, basically if the total cost is independent of the horizon, and if it is dependent on the horizon, then it's going to be h squared. So the bad news is that the information theoretic lower bound for offline RL is also on the order of h over n, which means basically that there exists some pathological MTP for which you cannot do better than h over n. So in the worst case, offline RL is not better. But what we're actually going to study is whether there are some special cases that are fairly common in reality where it is better. And it turns out that there are, and these special cases are not actually all that special. They basically reflect the intuition for these two bullet points at the top of the slide. So the formal results, uh, there's two of them. The first one has to do with critical states. So a state S is said to be non-critical uh, if the advantage of any action in that state is close to zero under the optimal policy. So that basically means that there are actions that are equally good. Correspondingly, a critical state is one where it's really important to take a particular action. So the intuition here is that state B is definitely a critical state, state A is not a critical state. Um, we're going to use P subscript C to be the fraction of critical states in the data set. If all the states are critical states, like the tightrope walker, then you can't do any better. But it turns out that the case where offline RL helps is where some states are critical states and some aren't. Because then there's actually a benefit to uh, being more careful in the critical states and less careful in non-critical states. If there are no critical states at all, or if all states are critical, then there's no gain to be had. So uh, the formal result, which is stated here, looks a lot like the results on the previous slide. There's still these h over n terms, but now they're multiplied by pc. So that means that the error is on the order of pc h over n. And the reason this is important is because if PC somehow relates to the horizon, then you can actually get better scaling with the horizon. For example, what if PC is roughly on the order of 1 over root H? So that means that there is a small fraction of states that are critical states. That's actually fairly reasonable. Um, if you imagine, for instance, robotic grasping, most of the time steps where you move the arm are not so critical, except for that one time step where you grasp the object. There you really need to do the right thing. The critical state thing doesn't mean that the actions don't matter in the non-critical states. It just means that in, uh, there are 
multiple good choices. So the intuition here is that in, in the non-critical states, you can afford to make some mistakes. In the critical states, you really can't afford them. So the practical insight here, stated informally, is that offline RL is preferred over BC uh, when the environment contains some fraction of critical states. So not all states are critical, but there are some critical states. So if that fraction, for example, is 1 over root h, then you shave off a square root of h factor, for example. So that's pretty nice. And I would actually argue that most realistic tasks do have critical states. So that means that we would expect this to help. The second formal result has to do with suboptimal data. And to make this kind of maximally um, good for imitation learning, we're going to say that behavior cloning is actually trained on optimal data, while offline RL gets slightly suboptimal data. And I'm going to define what suboptimal means in a second. So it turns out that offline RL on suboptimal data can be better than BC with optimal data if that suboptimal data is only a little bit suboptimal. So here's the formal result. Again, you see these things that look like h over n terms. And now, again, there's another multiplicative factor, and that factor is b. You can roughly speaking think of b as representing the coverage. So if you have optimal data, it's always good, but it's low coverage, meaning you don't see lots of other stuff. If b is big, that means that you kind of uh, feather your distribution around the optimal behavior. So the larger b is, the more coverage you have. And looking at this equation, you can kind of get the intuition that if, if you have very, very high coverage, then that root b term is going to cause you lots of error. But if you have just a little bit more coverage, then the fact that you're dividing by, by b for those h over n terms might actually reduce your error. Uh, b is uh, going to be between log of h over n and 1 for a somewhat technical reason. So low b is near optimal, high b is suboptimal. B can't go to zero, so if, uh, obviously if B goes to zero, this doesn't make sense. Uh, so B has a floor, and for the floor, you basically recover the H over N stuff from before. High B means the data becomes suboptimal, but covers more stuff. So again, you can see that there, there should be some sweet spot. For example, is if B is root H over N, that would be better. Um, and you can figure out kind of what the envelope is of B values for which this bound would be better than the standard h over n bound that we have otherwise. So the practical insight is that offline RL outperforms behavior cloning on uh, expert data, when behavior cloning gets expert data, when offline RL is provided with an equal amount of slightly suboptimal data that improves coverage but doesn't reduce optimality too much. Um, so besides the theoretical results, we've also done a number of uh, empirical experiments to try to validate these findings. Now, the, the results in the empirical experiments are actually a little bit interesting. Um, so you can see that in the table up, up above, there's actually three columns, behavior cloning, naive CQL, which is an offline RL method, and then tune CQL. Now, what is tune CQL? Well, tune CQL is the CQL algorithm with a particular offline tuning procedure applied to it. This procedure doesn't require any additional rollouts, so it doesn't actually make any additional assumptions, uh, but it does adjust the hyperparameters based on the offline data, intuitively you can think of it as roughly like a training and validation set, although it's not quite the same. Now, looking at these results, it's kind of interesting to note that naive CQL is not actually better than behavior cloning in many cases. These are expert data sets, of course. But tuned CQL is usually better. And that actually comes back to something I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, that one of the reasons we might prefer behavior cloning is that it's just a simple supervised learning procedure. And these results basically illustrate that that because offline RL is more complex, you do need to be a little careful in setting up the right tuning procedure to make it work. But if you do set that up, which as we are uh, shown in the paper can be done using the same offline data, then you do get better results as uh, uh, illustrated by the theory and then backed up by these results. And the same holds for Atari games as shown at the bottom. So if you wanna learn more about this, if you wanna see the proofs or the discussion of the setup for the experiments, check out the paper at the bottom by Avaral Kumar, uh, Joey Hong, and I get same called should I run offline reinforcement learning or behavior cloning? So next I'm going to address the other question. Can I get behavior cloning methods to actually solve RL problems? So it's good that you know offline RL does better than naive behavior cloning, but is there some fancy behavior cloning that we can cook up that could be better? So how do you get behavior cloning to work with highly suboptimal data, right? The nice thing about offline RL is that it doesn't actually require the data to be optimal, although as we saw before, it in principle beats BC even when it is. But if you have highly suboptimal data, what can you do? Well, imagine that you want to drive a car to a particular destination. 
and you have suboptimal data where the car doesn't go to that destination, but it goes somewhere else. Well, you could say that these demonstrations that you've received, they're not really demonstrations, they're suboptimal. You could say that they are optimal if your goal was something else. So if your goal was not to get to your real destination, but if your goal was to reach the actual final state in one of these trajectories, then it's a successful trajectory for that final state. And what you could do is you could train a policy that is conditioned on the final state. So instead of pi of a given s, you train a policy pi of a given s comma g, and during training you set g to whatever the final state in that trajectory was. So then for each demo, you maximize the log probability of the actions given the state and given the goal set to the last state in that demo. In general, you can condition on any information extracted from future states, so it doesn't have to be a goal position. It can be lots of stuff. And prior works have studied a number of different choices, including future goals, that's goal condition behavior cloning, as well as GCSL and other such algorithms. So there's a number of papers that have done this. You can condition on future events. Uh, conditional imitation learning, Codabil et al. is one method that does this. You can also condition on future rewards that you'll see. So this was uh, proposed in a number of papers, uh, reward condition policies by Avril Kumar, uh, upside down RL, decision transformers built on this idea. So there's a number of papers that propose this choice as well, and there are other choices too. So there are a number of things you can condition on. Uh, and what we're going to do in, in the uh, next few minutes is we're going to discuss a paper called RBS by Scott Emmons, uh, Benjamin Eisenbach, and Ilya Kostrykov, and myself, that kind of generalizes this into a general class of methods and studies how they stack up against offline RL techniques, and also what we need to do to make them work. So we're going to call this RBS, Reinforcement Learning via Supervised Learning. People called this lots of things before. We didn't invent this idea, uh, but we're just introducing this working title to encompass the whole class of methods because they've been called different things, goal condition, behavior cloning, reward condition policies, but you can really condition on anything, so it makes sense that you'd want to call them some, by some common name. And if you call them by a common name, you can also write down a common equation that describes the entire space of these methods. And here is that common equation that basically encompasses what all of these prior approaches do um, in a simplified way. For all the trajectories tau in your data set D, you're going to go over all the states in that trajectory, so all the time steps between the beginning and the end. And then you're going to have an expectation over all achieved outcomes in the remainder of that trajectory. So if you're at time step T, you'll take the rest of the trajectory from T to H, and you'll extract a potential outcome from it omega. And you might be able to extract more than one outcome, so that's why it's an expectation. And then you'll maximize the log probability of the action AT at that time step in that trajectory given the state ST and the extracted uh, outcome omega. So it's a standard behavior cloning loss where the policy is conditioned on this omega, this outcome or task descriptor, which could be a goal state, a language string, which way the car turned, how happy the user was, or the reward value, or anything else. And F is your relabeling function. F looks at the remainder of that trajectory and extracts a valid omega. There could be more than one. Um, so, for example, if you're doing goals, you might extract the last state in the remainder of that trajectory. You might also sample a random future state, so it doesn't have to be the last one, it could be anything in the middle there. If you're doing rewards, then you might sum up all the rewards in the remainder of the trajectory. You could do a discounted sum if you like, so there's a number of choices there. All right, so now I've got some questions. We've got our recipe. Intuitively, it kind of seems like this could do something useful, but we should ask some questions about it. Question one. Which decisions are important to make this work? Question two, does it actually work well as a reinforcement learning method, particularly in the offline RL setting? Uh, question four, that should actually be question three, but I skipped one step. What should we condition on? And does it matter what we condition on? I guess it's such a big question that I'm gonna put it as question four. All right, so let's start with question one, which decisions are important to make it work? Prior work has made a number of suggestions uh, for which decisions are important. Uh, for example, uh, some works uh, have said that you need iterative collection of online data. This is GCSL by Gosh et al. Uh, and by the way, I, I'm, I myself am responsible for some of these uh, not entirely correct hypotheses, so I'm not just blaming other people. Um, in re reward condition policies, we talked about how maybe you need to very carefully reweight the data. Uh, other work has argued that you need like really big models to make this work, like transformers. And basically the punchline is that None of these are really true. I mean, they're all true to a degree, but you can make things work without them and they're not essential ingredients. So we're going to use a two layer feed forward network with just uh, uh, 1,024 units each with no weighting, no online data collection, and no fancy transformers or sequence models. So we're just going to do the simplest thing, but we'll tune this pretty carefully 
just in kind of the bread and butter supervised learning sense of trading off bias and variance. So we're going to use a validation set. We're going to carefully adjust our capacity and so on. And it turns out that you do need to regularize this a little bit. Overfitting can actually be surprisingly a big problem with these RVS methods. So we're going to use dropout to regularize. And our fully connected layers are actually pretty big. If you were to do imitation learning on optimal data, you'd get away with a much smaller network. And that kind of makes sense because you're not just learning the optimal policy, you're learning a variety of policies. So it's big, but it's, it's not like a giant transformer. It's still a very modest network by comparison. All right. Um, and in the paper, by the way, we have analysis that shows that, you know, this is actually a good choice and we avoid it. Question two, does it actually work well as an RL method? And the answer here is actually surprisingly quite nuanced. So we're going to have this policy, A given S comma um, omega, and we're going to evaluate two variants, RVSG, which conditions on goals. So that's similar to like GCSL, for example, and RVSR, which conditions on rewards. And that's similar to our RPCs, upside down RL and decision transformers. And all implementations are going to use a simple feed forward network, those two hidden layers, trained with dropout without fancy weights or online data collection. So here are the results on two sets of D4RL tasks, the kitchen and the gym locomotion tasks. And I'm going to point out a few things about these results. So first, some good news. Either RVSG or RVSR, depending on which is better, tends to get results that are close to the best value-based RL results. So the value-based RL methods here are CQL, D3 plus VC, and one step RL. Yeah, so that's good. Um, CQL is the best performing method in, in, in uh, in the gym tasks, and actually behavior coin is the best one in the kitchen, although CQL is pretty close. But the RVS methods consistently get pretty, pretty darn close to that. So that's good. The idea basically works. Um, decision transformers, which is essentially an RVS method that uses uh, a giant transformer network, doesn't really do any better. So transformers are not really necessary for this. If you just take your uh, standard MLP and just carefully uh, tune bias and variance, every bit is good. So don't, don't, uh, worry about giant networks, unless you really need all that capacity, but for these tasks, you, you don't need it. But here's an interesting thing. Um, filtered behavior cloning, where you simply throw out the batch trajectories on the gym locomotion tasks, seem to do about as well, actually a tiny bit better. That, that's kind of weird. So, well, let's talk about what, why, why that is, what's going on here. And the reason has to do, actually has more to do with the benchmarks than it does with the method. So remember before I talked about how Imitation learning tries to copy the, the data, whereas in principle, offline reinforcement learning should pull out the good stuff from a heterogeneous data set containing a variety of trajectories. That's the idea. But do the benchmarks actually test this? Well, it depends on the benchmark. So in D4RL has a few different um, environments. The Majoko gym locomotion tasks, uh, they constitute a variety of behaviors, but typically the mode in the data set is actually pretty good. So of course, in expert data, the mode is expert. In the uh, medium data set, the mode tends to be on the upper end of what you, you can get. Um, random data sets, you can't really do anything effective there. Um, and then if you have something like a mixed medium expert data set, it's going to be still concentrated around the better end of the distribution. But the D4RL benchmark suite also has other tasks that do evaluate compositionality quite stringently. So the, the 2D and ant mazes, uh, consist of trajectories, none of which are optimal. So the goal is to go from the lower left corner to the upper right. There are no trajectories that actually do that, but there are lots of trajectories that go between other pairs of states. So this kind of multitask data really tests compositionality, the stitching ability. So we would say that the gym tasks are kind of simple diagnostic tasks, and the tasks that actually evaluate compositionality are really these ant maze tasks. Now, unfortunately, a lot of papers in offline are all tend to ignore these tasks because they're hard, but they're hard for a reason, because they're actually testing the real thing. So if you have our algorithms that, uh, RL algorithms that properly perform uh, dynamic programming and compositionality, we can take this idea much further and we should be able to get near optimal data from highly suboptimal data like these uh, ant maze tasks. So let's look at the results there. And we're gonna, again, walk through these. So one thing we see is that pure filtered behavior cloning now is quite bad. So it's significantly behind, for example, uh, the best dynamic programming methods. Value-based offline RL dynamic program with CQL works very well. Interestingly, RVSR, which is reward conditioned, and decision transform, which is also reward conditioned, they're both quite bad. In fact, they're actually worse than filtered behavior cloning. But goal conditioned RVS is very good. So this is very interesting. And um, this is going to help us answer uh, that uh, last question, what should you condition? 
So behavioral cloning doesn't automatically benefit from compositionality. That's the problem. And we need compositionality in order to stitch together these suboptimal trajectories. That's why CQL works so well. Dynamic programming methods based on Q-learning are very good at this because Bellman backups encode temporal compositionality. They encode the idea that if you have a transition from A to B and you have another trans transition from B to C, you can stitch those together. So you back up the value from C to B, and then if you have a different trajectory that goes to B or a state similar to B, then that value will get backed up into A. And you don't even have to revisit B exactly, as long as it's similar, as long as the representation inside the network generalizes across it. So that's very, very powerful. All right, so why does RVSG work then? RVSG isn't doing this. Well, I think the key is that in RVSG, you get compositionality, but for a different reason. Because you're conditioning on goals, and goals are spatial, you get spatial compositionality. You understand that if you reach a goal and there's another goal nearby, then you can reach that nearby one with a, a small change to the policy. So that addresses that last question. What should we condition on, and does it matter? The answer is yes, it matters very much. In fact, it matters a lot more than the decisions put forward in prior work, like whether you do online collection, or whether you do weighting, or whether you use a giant transformer network or a simple MLP. The answer is, you can use a simple MLP, that's totally fine, but it does matter a great deal that you condition on the right thing, and if you condition on the wrong thing, all those other choices aren't gonna save you. So the kind of the truth about these RVS methods is that you're basically putting an inductive bias through your choice of what you condition on, and if you make that choice correctly, you can get good results. But of course, that choice is somewhat domain dependent because for the ant maze, we know that goals matter. That's prior knowledge that we're bringing to bear on the problem. So the takeaways here are that reinforcement learning via supervised learning can solve offline RL problems, but it lacks compositionality out, out of the box, compositionality that real dynamic programming, real value-based methods do have. But you can somehow somewhat make up for this by being very careful about what you condition on and actually get good results. So the space of goals, rewards, etc., can encode some inductive bias about how to be compositional. And if you pick the right inductive bias for your problem, you can get this to work. But if you pick the wrong inductive bias, then no amount of you know, fancy architectures or other tricks is going to save you. All right, so in the last part of the talk, we're going to talk about how we can actually combine behavioral cloning ideas in RL. So not in the sense of the previous part where we were simply trying to get behavioral cloning to solve RL problems, but in the sense of taking a behavioral cloning and putting something else on top of it. And this can actually work quite well, and it can actually lead to real offline RL methods. So the idea is basically this. Offline RL is doing these two things. It's staying close to the provided data, and it's maximizing reward. And you can think of these also as two steps. Step one is to fit a density model to the data, and that's exactly what behavioral cloning does. And step two is somehow use that density model to maximize reward, which is essentially a planning procedure. In fact, we could say, roughly speaking, that any offline RL methods method does some kind of planning. If you're doing dynamic programming, you're essentially planning a training time. If you're doing a model-based RL in a, like an MPC planner, you're planning a test time. But if you're planning a test time, then step one just amounts to fitting a density model. And we can do this in various ways. And I'm going to discuss various instantiations of this idea that all revolve around the same basic principle and end up working very well by essentially combining behavioral cloning with some kind of planning. I'm going to talk about the trajectory transformer, which is essentially model-based RL with transformers. I'm going to talk about deep imitative models, uh, which are actually a very similar idea. It predates trajectory transformer by several years, but imitative models fit normalizing flows to the data distribution and then find high probability trajectories that have a high reward via planning. And then I'll talk about a very recent work of ours called Viking, which fits a policy with goal condition behavior cloning and then plans over a sequence of goals to reach a destination by a graph search. So it's a different instantiation, but very similar principles. The common theme is there's step one, which is to fit a density model to the data, and step two, which is to do some kind of planning inside of this distribution. And that's going to combine the simplicity of behavior cloning with the performance benefits of offline RL. Of course, it does make it more complex because the planning adds complexity over regular BC, but it still benefits from that ability to train large models on large data sets in a scalable way. All right, so let's start with the trajectory transformer. The idea is to fit a transformer to the data distribution and then find high probability trajectories that have high reward. This is work uh, done by uh, Michael Jammer and Chiang Li uh, in a paper called Offline Reinforcement Learning as One Big Sequence Modeling Problem in NERVS 2021. So step one, we're going, to, we're going to train a transformer. And that transformer, you can think of it as trajectory level behavior cloning. 
So it's not just predicting the next action, it's actually predicting an entire trajectory, which is gonna make it a model, amenable to model-based plant. So let's say that you have some trajectory, it consists of states, actions, and rewards. So that's what we're gonna call a trajectory. What we're going to do is we're gonna tokenize it. So for every state and action, we'll actually make every dimension of every state and action a separate token. So in the picture on the left, uh, we have n-dimensional states and n-dimensional actions. So that's why there's n state tokens and n action tokens. That's just for one time step. That might seem like a, a, a very extravagant discretization, and it kind of is, but the point is that transformers should be quite good at attending over um, long sequences. This, this can work quite well. And the fact that we're tokenizing and then discretizing allows us to model very complex distributions. So every dimension of every state, action, and reward is a token, and that token is discretized based on its range. And then we just fit this model. And this model represents the distribution over trajectories in the data set. You can also, of course, uh, treat, you know, since this is a sequence model, you can use it to get a distribution over future states, actions, and rewards given an initial state. So you can forecast, you can predict what will happen. And you're predicting based on the distribution in the data set. Now, this works very well as a density modeling strategy. So the video at the top shows the trajectory transformer predicting a rollout for the humanoid uh, Mujoku gym task. The humanoid is very high dimensional and this is predicting very far into the future. So the prediction over time is massively better than what you would get with a conventional autoregressive model. But of course, what you want to do is not just sample trajectories similar to the data set, you want to do control of this. So that's where step two comes in. Now, if you wanted to just decode the maximum likelihood trajectory from the sequence model, if you want to basically maximize the log probability of the rest of the states, actions, and rewards given a starting state, you could do this, and this is actually a very standard problem in uh, language models. You do this by decoding the max likelihood sequence, which can be done with beam search. So this is like one of the most classic things to do with sequence models. But we don't want the most likely trajectory. We want a trajectory that gets high reward and is decently likely. So what we're going to do is we're going to add the reward to this likelihood. And this doesn't actually involve changing the algorithm at all. The same beam search procedure can do this. It's just that now you're going to add the reward to your likelihoods. And if you want, if you have a Q function, for example, if you, if you also did dynamic programming, you can add the Q function at the end as a terminal Q function. Now, you don't have to. And in the paper, we show what happens even without a terminal Q function. But for the hardest tasks, this can really help. So let's look at the results. Uh, on, the, uh, on the easier tasks, the, the Mujoko Gym locomotion tasks, what I called kind of diagnostic tasks before, uh, you know, the best methods all do about equally well. So here's a, a bar graph. You don't want to look at the numbers, but the short version is that classic value-based offline RL, in this case CQL, gets 77.6. Decision transformers, which is you know, essentially conditional behavior cloning methods like the ones I talked about before, gets 74.7. And then the trajectory transformer gets 78.9. And these are all kind of uh, similar numbers, uh, about the same performance. But as I mentioned before, these tasks don't evaluate compositionality. The really interesting test for this, of course, is what happens when you do need compositionality. And that's where we saw RVS-style methods really struggling in the previous portion of the talk. So let's see how the trajectory transformer does. So we're going to look at the ant maze tasks. And here the goal really is to combine suboptimal trajectories into a more optimal behavior. And in, in this case, we will add a Q function at the end of the trajectory transformer. And the Q function here is taken from the IQL algorithm, which is a recent uh, value-based RL method. Now, IQL by itself gets an average score of 63.2. Trajectory transformer gets an average score of 84, significantly better than both the source of its Q function and an RBS approach. Uh, in fact, it's better even than all of the RBS approaches that I discussed in the previous section. Not only that, but the performance on the, uh, some of the medium tasks is basically maxing out. So a score of 100.0 is the maximum you get on this task, uh, which means that the medium tasks are essentially solved at this point. The hard tasks, uh, the large tasks, still have some room for improvement. So that's pretty nice. Just by combining this behavior cloning-like idea with planning, we can significantly uh, lift up the performance. Of course, here, it's not just simple behavior cloning. It does have to represent a full model over the system, and that's harder but that merits using a very large model. All right, let's talk about deep imitative models. Deep imitative models were proposed uh, a few years ago. Uh, they were published in iClear 2020, but the paper came out a bit before that. And uh, this is work by Nicholas Reinhardt and Rowan McAllister. 
The idea is actually very similar, although applied in a more specialized setting uh, with autonomous driving in mind. So the idea is to fit a normalizing flow to the data distribution uh, and then find high probability trajectories that have high reward via gradient descent. So step one, just like in the trajectory transformers density model, we're going to take a data set. Uh, in this case, uh, it's a data set of demonstrations of driving a car, but driving a car to various places and in various ways. And we're going to train a model that represents the distribution or future positions of the car given the current observation. So you can think of this as a probability of every position for the car in the future, so that's a sequence, given the current LiDAR image. It's not predicting future LiDAR images, it's predicting future positions given a current LiDAR image. And we call this an imitative model, so uh, I'm going to use the symbol Q of S1 through capital T. S here is not the full state of the system, it's just the position of the, of the ego agent of the car, given phi 1, phi 1 is the context observation, that's the LiDAR image that you're seeing right now. So basically it's, it's answering the question, what are all possible future paths a human driver might take given the current LiDAR observation? And then step two is to use this for planning. So the planner is going to plan a sequence of future waypoints, future positions, to minimize the cost of the plan, so the cost function is just given, minus uh, these log probabilities. So that's like maximizing reward plus the probability. And this has two interpretations. One interpretation is just it's just a standard cost minimizing planner where you add negative log Q to the cost. So you basically pay a price for uh, deviating from high probability trajectories. But you can also interpret this as, as an inference procedure. So if you treat the costs as a pseudo likelihood, as the negative log P of S, uh, as, as a negative log probability of the goal given the states, then you can say this is finding the most likely states given the current observation and a desired goal. This is your driving goal, basically. So schematically, you can think of it like this. Uh, we have this imitative model trained from human data. We're going to have the task specified in some way, like for example, a region that we should uh, drive to. And then we're going to, we're going to run this inference procedure to infer the most likely uh, positions to drive to given the current observations and the goal, which will basically amount to planning with a cost uh, where you add the probabilities for, uh, from the model. And this works really well. So here's a video of deep imitative models driving in Carla. So it gets high level waypoints. You can think of it as basically like, a kind of like Google, ma Google Maps and those are the orange diamonds. Uh, but it figures out how to do things like stop behind other cars. Uh, it figures out how to you know, avoid driving on sidewalks, that sort of thing. Now here, these are you know, fairly easy scenarios. Like the waypoints are, are basically correct. Nothing weird happens on the road. But we can also stress test this a little bit. So here we're going to give it waypoints that are especially far away. So uh, you can see the, the green uh, crosses on the left here to represent the waypoints. And the red curve here shows the trajectory planned by this gradient descent planner using the imitative model. Now we're going to simulate noisy waypoints. So we'll actually corrupt those waypoints with positional noise. And sometimes those, that noise will like put them inside a building or something. And this is where the likelihoods really come in because the model understands that the likelihood of driving into a building is very low. So when the waypoint is really corrupted like that, it will ignore that. Next, uh, we're going to add some additional cost terms to tell the vehicle to swerve around particular positions on the road. And here it does swerve around them when it's safe to do so because it knows that there's some variability. Now we're going to switch the GPS into UK mode where the waypoints are always on the left side of the road. And you can see that what the car does is it basically does the next closest thing. So it drives in the direction of the waypoint but stays on the right side because going on the left side is very unlikely under the data. All right, the last method I'm going to discuss, which is, again, a variant on the same theme. It's called Viking. Uh, and Viking is a little different because it's going to actually apply a hierarchical concept to this, but still a similar philosophy. So the idea is going to be to fit a policy with goal condition behavior cloning, and then plan over a sequence of goals to reach a destination. So again, there's a modeling and a planning component. So step one will be to model actions and distances, in this case, by a goal condition behavior cloning. So we're going to be controlling this uh, ground robot. And uh, we collected uh, data using this ground robot. Actually, several years back, we collected about 40 hours of data. And using this data, we'll train a goal condition behavior cloning model. This is essentially RVSG. But this model is going to predict, given the current observation and a goal, it's going to actually predict three different quantities. It's going to predict the action to take right now, but it's also going to predict the distance to the goal in time steps. And we're going to use this for planning later on. It's going to predict the action, and then it's going to predict an offset in the GPS coordinate. And that's also going to be utilized for planning. So step two is going to be to use this model to plan. Now, since it's a goal condition model, it might already be intuitive how it can be used for planning. 
nodes that you plan over are images. And the edge weights between those nodes are the distances predicted by the model. So you can give the model any two images and have a predicted distance. So that gives you uh, an edge cost between any two nodes. So you can construct a graph and then use any graph-based search. Now that works fine if you're in an environment where you already have lots of observations and you can build this graph. But what if you're in a new environment that you haven't seen before? Well, in that case, you need to build the graph as you go. And that turns out to be quite hard. So let's say that you're in a new environment. Here's what you're seeing now, right now. And your goal is the picture on the right. What do you do? Well, you can roughly surmise that because your goal has this building with a white door, then maybe the thing you need to do is somehow drive towards that white building that you see in the background because a white door will probably be on a white building. But you have to kind of make a guess. Um, so what we're going to do in Viking is we're going to do a little bit better than just guessing. We're actually going to also give the robot a satellite image. Now the satellite image might not be up to date, like there might be some stuff blocking some road, there might be a giant truck parked somewhere and that does actually happen, but it gives you a pretty good hint. We're going to tell it the GPS coordinate of the goal and its current GPS coordinate, but those have pretty large errors. You know, they might be off by up to five meters. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the GPS coordinates and that satellite map as a kind of planning heuristic in a procedure that resembles a star search. So we're going to have basically a map heuristic model. Given the current state, final goal, and a predicted waypoint position, is it likely to be on the path to the final goal? And we're going to guess. And we're going to train this with a basically a variant of contrastive learning. So the complete system is going to look like this. When you're on the frontier of your currently explored region, you're going to sample a waypoint, and you're going to try to use that heuristic model and the satellite image to guess is that waypoint on the path to the goal, and then you'll run it through essentially a kind of a modified A-star planner. So it's a physical, essentially, A-star search using a map-based heuristic. So again, a variant on the same principle. Step one, train a model to imitate the data. Step two, plan using that model. So here's kind of a, a summary of what's going on here. You have two models. The, uh, the bottom one takes in the current image on the goal. The top one takes in a satellite image. And there's some final destination. You're going to plan a path to that destination using these two models. And the cool thing about Viking is that it can plan paths very far away you know, a, a kilometer or more. So here's a video of this in action. The top right image shows the final destination, but that's not actually the goal that we command to the model. The goal we can command to the model is determined by the, uh, this A-star procedure. Uh, in the lower right, you can see the uh, path through the satellite image, uh, and in the lower left, you can see what the robot is seeing. And the center image is actually recorded by Drew Shaw, the first author in this work, who has to uh, valiantly chase after the robot with a camera which is uh, you know, about as exhausting as it sounds. And you can see there that the robot actually did a little U-turn, so it wandered off in the wrong place and had to turn around. So that's okay, that happens sometimes. The satellite image doesn't tell you everything, but eventually it gets to the goal successfully. In fact, it can uh, solve many tasks that are up to a kilometer or more in length. You can take it on a hike. Uh, this is a 2.7 kilometer hike. It can deal with the case where there's an obstruction. So here we ran two trials. In the first one, shown in pink, there was no truck parked there. Later on, someone parked a truck, which actually blocks that path. The truck blocks the whole path from the fence to the building, and the robot took a different path to the goal. The truck was, of course, not in the satellite image, but it's only used as a heuristic, so it still works. Here, the blue curve shows what happens with the full Viking system. The pink curve is what happens if you exclude the satellite map but still give a GPS. It actually does something kind of sensible. Of course, it has to backtrack a little bit more because it gets stuck in, a, in an impassable region, but it still succeeds at the task eventually. And then without even GPS, it still tries to valiantly search through the environment, but uh, is unable to reach the goal. All right, so the takeaways. Behavior cloning alone is not enough to solve offline RL problems in many cases, but you can shoehorn behavior cloning into RL tasks, although it's a little bit of an awkward fit. But it, but it can serve as a really effective step one in more sophisticated offline RL methods. Uh, but then you still need step two, some kind of planning, either a training time or a test time. And if you do that, then you can get compositionality or you can inject it through inductive bias if you're careful with things like goals. So these are the questions I covered. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And I'd especially like to uh, acknowledge the students that were uh, the instrumental to like actually carrying out this research. Thank you very much.